ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. It's Wednesday, May 8th, 2024, and I'm calling to order night five of Arlington's 2024 annual town meeting. And shortly, we'll be transitioning into the special town meeting. There are three spaces that are reserved for town meeting members and town officials, employees, and vendors. And those are the auditorium floor, the center balcony, and the satellite room in the town hall annex. If you are a member of the public, you cannot be in those spaces during the meeting. If you currently are, please relocate to one of the galleries, which are the wings of the balcony. There's obviously been a lot of attention on Article 5 of the special town meeting, the resolution which involves a very serious and challenging subject. We welcome the many guests tonight in the gallery. If we get to Article 5, there is going to be a lot of potential for heightened emotions. Nevertheless, I expect appropriate behavior in this chamber. For town meeting members, I already went through that on Monday. For members of the public observing from the gallery, let me describe three kinds of inappropriate behavior at town meeting. First, there's momentary loss of control, like cheering or applause. Please try to refrain from that. Then there's premeditated stuff that serves as a distraction to the meeting, like holding signs, banners, or waving flags. Definitely don't do that. And finally, there's interrupting speakers, the presenters down here at the podiums in front, like shouting or chanting while they're talking. And there's zero tolerance for that. I don't want to be in the position of asking anyone to leave tonight. But my number one job is keeping this meeting under control so that we can do the business that the people of Arlington have asked us to do. That's a lot of things not to do. Let me close with just what we must do. This process is now in the hands of town meeting, and we must allow town meeting to do its work. You may hear things from presenters tonight that you deeply disagree with. They may even cause you pain. You may find those things wrongheaded or even harmful, and you might be right. While we're in this chamber, I ask that you summon the strength within yourself to endure your disagreements with grace. Every time you succeed in doing that, you strengthen this institution and you reinforce the principles of the Republic on which it's built. With that in mind, please rise for the national anthem. We need to take a few quick votes to adjourn the annual town meeting and open our special town meeting. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
I move to adjourn the annual town meeting until immediately after the special town meeting adjourns or dissolves or to Monday, May 13th, 2024, whichever comes sooner. Okay, we have a second um, to adjourn the annual town meeting uh, until after the special town meeting adjourns or dissolves and, uh, or until Monday, whichever uh, happens first. Uh, all those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. I call the special town meeting to order. This is still Wednesday, May 8th, 2024. Mr. DeCourcy? Yeah. Ms. Oh, uh, we're, we'll get to that after. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is requested that the members of the select board and elected officials of the town, town manager, department heads of the town and staff, superintendent of schools and staff, committees, commissions and boards of the town, Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School District Committee and Superintendent, members of the general court representing Arlington, members of the Arlington Retirement Board, employees and volunteers supporting electronic voting, and also any consultants who have been retained to work for the town relative to articles to be acted on by this meeting and representatives of the news media be permitted to sit within the town meeting enclosure. We have a second. All those in favor, say, say yes. All those opposed, it, it, um, it is affirmative. The constables return. Madam Clerk, do you have reason to believe that this meeting was appropriately called by the select board and that the constable made a return of service on the warrant in accordance with the laws? I do. Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the special town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 13th, 2024, at 8 p.m. Okay, we have a second for the motion. If we don't finish the special town meeting tonight, we adjourn until Monday at 8 p.m. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. Are there any announcements or resolutions? Uh, Ms. Dray? And we're, we still might be, we're still looking for handset 12, so look for that. Thank, Ms. Dre. Good evening. Yes? Yes. Good evening, town, uh, town meeting. How do I do this? Okay. Thank you. Good evening, town meeting. Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. I am thrilled to be in front of you to provide a brief announcement about the Arlington Teosinte Sister City Project of which I am a board member. I'd like to introduce fellow board member and resident Arlington resident Stephanie Kuntz to present a brief update with you, Mr. Moderator. Yep. I'll allow it, of course. Yep. Hello. Dear Arlington Town meeting members, thank you for being here and doing the work of Arlington. I am Stephanie Kuntz. I have lived in Arlington with my family since 2004. In the spring of 2015, my son Ben was in fourth grade, and as part of the curriculum at Pierce Elementary, he learned about Teosinte, a village in El Salvador. Later that fall, our family of four went to live in Teosinte for two months, which was an incredibly special experience for all of us. Arlington and Teosinte have been sister cities since 1988. We are part of a larger organization in which various cities and towns from the United States have partnered with communities from El Salvador since the Civil War there. The U.S. El Salvador Sister Cities Organization is based on a solidarity model between communities with the acknowledgement that each have much to give and much to receive. In 2005, Arlington resident Beth Salzberg and town meeting member Elizabeth Dre strengthened the connection between our two communities by traveling to Teosinte and on their return worked with a group of volunteers to develop what is the current Arlington Teosinte Sister City Project. Primary and secondary school students in Arlington learn about Teosinte as part of the curriculum. 
We help organize educational events here, such as co-sponsoring the recent Arlington Reed selection, Solito. We provide a market by selling crafts made by the Women's Sewing Cooperative from Teosinte. The money from these crafts goes back directly into the community by funding student scholarships for high school and university and village infrastructure projects as determined by their own town council. We also have a direct relationship with the people of Teosinte, strengthened by visits there. Three of us, Elizabeth and myself being two of them, went last month to visit and again experienced being in this amazing community. And it's, very, it's a very interesting, amazing community that we would love to share more information about. We feel newly inspired and that we have a lot to learn from them. Of course, WhatsApp has completely changed communications. We encourage all of you to get more involved with the Arlington Teosinte Sister City Project in any way you can. We have an active board as well as member volunteers in a variety of ways to learn more and do more. Tonight, we've been selling excellent handmade crafts from Teosinte as well as delicious coffee grown nearby to directly benefit their community. Please come by at the break and visit. Thank you. Do we have any other announcements or resolutions? Yeah, in the front row. Joe Solomon, Precinct 16. I'd like to introduce my neighbor, Leah Lyman Waldron, who wishes to speak. And they're a resident of Arlington? So, yes. Uh, and she has the right to speak. Welcome. Members of town meeting, my name is Leah Lyman Waldron. I am a resident in Arlington and also pastor at Park Avenue Congregational Church in Arlington Heights. As you may know, in November and January, two members of our community were struck and injured in crashes while crossing at the intersection of Park Avenue and Wollaston and Paul Revere. One of them, Linda Cohn, was a parishioner of mine at Park Avenue Congregational Church. Almost six months later, Linda continues to recover. Her life and her family's lives have been changed forever by an avoidable tragedy. Safety along Park Avenue has long been a concern for Arlington residents. But these two incidents in particular pushed some of us who live nearby to create a petition asking for the select board to support changes at that intersection and elsewhere along Park Avenue, and for the town to focus its efforts on pedestrian, bike, and vehicle safety across town. I wanted to share my sincere thanks to over 1,000 people who shared and signed that petition, many of whom are here tonight as well as to the select board for hearing and supporting our efforts to increase safety on our roads. I also wanted to thank Chief Julie Flaherty uh, and the Arlington Police Department and the Department of Public Works for their immediate response to these incidents, including increased monitoring of Park Avenue, signage installation, and enforcement of speed limits. And I want to thank Town Manager Jim Feeney and Transportation Planner John Alessi from the Planning Department for their ongoing efforts to make real, lasting change in pedestrian and road safety. You may have noticed short-term improvements, such as new crosswalk signage on Park Avenue at the intersection with Wollaston and Paul Revere, as well as an in-street pedestrian bollard at Park Avenue and Oakland. Looking forward with the fiscal year 2025 budget that you recently approved, the town will start design work that will lead to near-term permanent improvements and a clear roadmap for the future of this heavily traveled road. In parallel with work on Park Avenue, the town will be developing a traffic calming guide that enables short-term solutions town-wide. Because these, th these things take time to do well, and some of the ongoing work is behind the scenes, I wanted to share this update and my gratitude for how thoroughly the town has responded, as many people work to make increased pedestrian safety a reality here in Arlington. I hope that the model followed here will be extended to other problem areas in town and that you all will continue to communicate with the town about road safety needs and to support their efforts in this direction. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there any other announcements or, uh, and resolutions? Oh, yeah, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, 
I would like to invite everyone to a free concert right here in Arlington's beautiful and acoustically perfect town hall on Sunday afternoon, June 9th, 3 p.m. It's a tribute to Alan Hovannis, uh, who was Arlington's greatest composer, grew up here on Blossom Street, graduated from Arlington High School in 1929. If you're not familiar with the work of Alan Hovannis, look him up. He has a lot of stuff on YouTube and Spotify and whatever. He's a brilliant composer. Uh, the, uh, I've left flyers in the lobby for the concert that you can pick up. And uh, did I mention that it's free? It's co-sponsored by, by the Armenian Cultural Foundation and the Myrock Foundation. So I hope to see you all here. It's really going to be an excellent concert featuring some great local musicians. So. Great, thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Okay, I just have one uh, quick, uh, our sleuthing has discovered that it's possible that one of the town meeting members from Precinct 1 may have the missing handset. So if you're in Precinct 1, can you please check your handsets to make sure that it has your name on it? Thank you. We found it, all right. All right. All right. I'll, I'll allow that applause. Okay. Uh, the comments about the applause and cheering, that's really for the debate under the articles. Uh, no, just, so that's clear. Um, okay, that brings us to Article 1 of the special town meeting, uh, which is reports of boards and committees. Mr. De Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I move that the report of the select board be received. We have a second to receive the select board report for the special town meeting. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. Any other reports of committee? Ms. Zemberg? Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. I move that the report of the Redevelopment Board be received. Okay. We have a second to receive the Re Redevelopment Board's report to special town meeting. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Hopefully she didn't slip anything in there that we didn't see. Just kidding. All right. Uh, yep, Ms. Teschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that the recommended votes in those reports be before the meeting without further motion. Okay, we have a second to receive the recommended votes of the reports uh, when those articles come up without further uh, motion. Uh, we have a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. I move that Article 1 be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a, a motion to lay Article 1 upon the table, and we have a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. That takes us to a test vote. Okay, and the test question is, was Massachusetts, okay, the, the voting is turned on, uh, uh, voting is open. The test question is, was Massachusetts the ninth state to ratify the Constitution meeting the two-thirds threshold of the original 13 states required for it to take effect for those states that ratified. If all of that is true, vote one for yes. If you think any of that is false, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion fails, and that is correct. <laughs> Massachusetts was the ninth state, not the sixth. Uh, the ninth was New Hampshire. What's that? Mass what is that? What's that? Oh, we need to go through the votes. No? Well, we should to double check, right? So let's, while we're looking at that, what, what is the claim? 
Oh, New, New Hampshire was the ninth. Did I say sixth? Okay, there we go. Thank you. So that's why we have a test vote to kind of shake things out of, out of our system, right? Okay, Article 2 of the Special Town Meeting is now before us. Um, you have a point of order? Oh, can you come to a microphone so okay, otherwise folks in the satellite room won't hear you or on the video? Thank you. Matt Miller, uh, Precinct 11. Uh, the question was, just for clarification, after voting closes, additional votes count, but they've already been uh, voted. They just haven't been uh, counted yet. Is that correct? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you said voting closed, and then numbers kept increasing. Um, do you have an explanation? Like, do we know why the numbers were still increasing after the, the, the green the light, light was off? off? Yeah. I see. So th there's some latency between the clicking of the buttons and the registering of the votes in the database. Totally fine. Just clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So that brings us to Article Two of the Special Town Meeting. Um, okay. So, uh, Mr. DeCourcy, do you want to lead us off? And actually, before we start that, can we just show the? Uh, the speaker queue, and then we'll clear it, and then folks who want to request to speak uh, can do so. There it is. We have an empty speaker queue, so if you're interested in speaking on this article, you can, you can start clicking it. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It's Stephen DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, the Select Board moved unanimously for favorable action to amend the Poet Laureate Screening Committee membership. Um, the Poet Laureate, the Screening Committee came to us and they requested a change. There are five members to the Screening Committee. They requested that rather than simply a town meeting appointment by the moderator, that the most recent Poet Laureate be a member. Um, and if that person or prior Poet Laureate could not be a member, the, the moderator would appoint a town meeting member. I do have to apologize to the body. We do have a, a minor amendment, and it has to do with the um, sentence in terms of the confirmation process. The way it works presently is that the screening committee recommends a candidate. That candidate is confirmed by the select board. That's what we voted. We voted a change to allow the former poet laureate uh, to, to join the committee. The way it's written in the report is that all members are confirmed by the select board. We're not, and we don't have any interest, nor did town meeting, I'm sure, have any interest in us designating each member of the screening committee. So we've offered a, a minor amendment, if, if we can put that up, and basically what it does is it strikes the word all members from the bottom middle of section two, and we're gonna ask that you insert the screening committee's recommendation for poet laureate shall be confirmed by the select board so that the process is just the same as it is now. Um, that's the highlighted language is the change that's going to be proposed through the motion to amend. Our vice chair, uh, Mrs. Mahan, will be making the motion to amend. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the amendment be received. Okay, we have, we have the Mahan Amendment is, is now before us. Okay, and ju just uh, for folks trying to understand the process here uh, and why this is allowed, uh, this is exercising option three from the town meeting guidelines for submitting motions. If it's short enough within roughly 20 words and it's uh, simple enough, uh, that we would allow it from the floor, which, which, which is what we've done here because of the short notice uh, since uh, the select board report for the special town meeting only became available yesterday. Um, so, okay, so we have it up here. Striking all members and inserting the screening committee's recommendation for poet laureate shall be confirmed by the select board. Okay. Okay, 
So, and now we have a speaker queue, so we'll go to Mr. Gersh first, and then uh, Mr. Jaspin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Gersh, Precinct 18. I move that we lay Articles 2 through 4 upon the table. We have a motion to lay Articles 2 through 4 on the table, and, we, and I heard a second. Um, so this is a two-thirds vote. Uh, all those in favor of, uh, which would bring us to Article 5, in case people haven't been able to do the math. Um, all those in favor of laying Articles 2 through 4 on the table, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. It is not a two-thirds vote. So we'll continue with Article 2. Thank you. Uh, I'll take Mr. Jaspin and then Ms. Thornton. Ms. Thornton. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Lewitton. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, I'm, I'm a bit confused by the change. So for most committees um, or um, that are on, they, the um, nominees go in front of the select board and the select board um, approves them or reviews them in some way. Um, is this changing that for this committee, that process? I'm having trouble hearing you, Mr. Jim. Can you I'm sorry. A closer <coughs> to the, and also, this is a general, I'll pause the timer for a second. Uh, I should have mentioned this earlier. For folks at the podium, uh, if you can, uh, Put your face about like one fist distance from the microphone. I hear that that, that should help. Um, okay. Even, even if you're really tall. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, my understanding is that for most committees, um, when people come up to be uh, nominated or selected for those committees, they go in front of the select board and are approved or is it received? I forget how that works. Is this changing the, that general process for this committee? That's my question. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Moderator. That's Stephen DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. As to this committee, what we're proposing doesn't change the process that we followed since 2014. There are five appointing authorities in Library Board of Trustees, the School Committee, the Commission on Arts and Culture, um, we're proposing a change to have either the most recent poet laureate or the town moderator, and the final one is a designee of the town manager. Those individuals on the screening committee have never been confirmed by the select board. Okay. It's only the poet laureate, his, herself, his self or herself, that comes before us once the screening committee makes a recommendation. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ms. Malopchik. And can we clear the speakers who have spoken or have passed, please? Thank you. Go ahead. Beth Malofchak, Precinct um, 9. I would like to know um, how many uh, appoint... Uh, I question the appointing authority of the town manager and the town moderator. I, I see this as a diminishment in the appointing authority of the town moderator. And so I just like to know a tally, if possible. Uh, a tally of what? Like for this committee? Or? No, for all committees. So how many appointments to committees does the town manager make? How many appointments to committees does the town moderator make? We've seen in past years a diminishment. Hold, hold, hold on. We've seen in past years a diminishment of the town moderator's appointing authority, um, which I happen to take a front to. So you're asking so, like positions uh, uh, across all committees yes, appointed by yes, the town yes. manager or the moderator. I, I don't know that number off the top of my head, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, we don't have an exact number on that right now. So I rose just to say that I would prefer the town moderator's appointing authority not um, be diminished uh, as a habit, which it seems to have been the case. As I said, in past years, we saw uh, under different town moderators that appointing authority diminished. So how do you decide? Where do you take it from? What, what was the question? 
who decides who loses the appointing authority? Until we make this change, the town moderator gets to appoint somebody. We make this change, the town moderator doesn't appoint someone. <clears throat> uh, town meeting decides to change that appointing authority. Uh, not the people on the committee. Right. Okay. It's the authority of the yeah the the so, the establishment of the committees and uh, and the and the charter and the membership and so on is the purview of town meeting. Okay, so I'm just one person who doesn't want to see the town moderator's appointing authority in general diminished as it has been in previous years. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I, have, I have no comment on that either way. Um, okay. Uh, Ms. Point of order or? Can I come? And then we'll take Mr. Lewicki. Thanks, Ms. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, a, a few seconds ago, Barbara Thornton's name appeared on the speaker's list. My understanding is that she resigned from town meeting. And I just checked the list of current town meeting members, and there's no Thornton, and there's only one Barbara. So I'm wondering, how did she get on the speaker's list? Uh, Madam Clerk, did you want to explain that? Sure. Here. Julie Brazil, town clerk. Uh, yes, Barbara resigned, and the other members of Precinct 16 appointed Marvin Lewiton to fill the vacancy until the next town election. We just didn't get that information updated on the thing. So Marvin is voting Barbara's device, and we'll get the name updated when we can. So it's really Mr. Lewiton with really weird spelling. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Jaspin, did, did Mr. Jaspin pass already? Pass. Okay, and we're done. So we're going to go ahead now with a, uh, a vote on the Mahan Amendment, which we saw on the screen earlier. Uh, that the screening committee's recommendation for Poet Laureate shall be confirmed by the select board. So if you're in favor, if you're Yep, that looks good. Uh, voting is now open, so if you're in favor of applying the Mahan Amendment to the main motion, press one for yes. If you're opposed to applying that amendment, press two for no, or three to abstain. You have 10 seconds to vote. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes 197 in the affirmative, uh, nine in the negative, nine abstentions. Uh, so we now have before us the main motion as amended by the Mahan Amendment. Uh, so let's now take a vote now on, the main, uh, on that main motion. Which, yeah, so voting is now open. So if you're in favor of uh, the main motion as amended by the Mahan Amendment, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no. Oh, okay, so let's hold on, let's hold. Okay, we're still showing a, uh, oh, it's a, it, okay. Are folks objecting to the, that it says amendment in the title? Because it's a bylaw amendment. The main motion is a bylaw amendment. Okay, okay so I think we're good. So, okay, uh, voting is now open. If you're in favor of the main motion as amended by the Mahan Amendment, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no to leave the, bylaw, the town bylaws intact. And press, or three to abstain. Okay, voting is closed. And the motion passes. 197 in the affirmative, seven in the negative, five abstentions. That takes us to Article 3. Uh, Ms. Zenberry, do you want to lead us off? And uh, while she comes up, let's show the speaker queue and clear that. Can you see the votes? Uh, okay, if there was a, uh, hold on a second, let's, uh, can, we, can we scroll through those votes? If there was some sort of discrepancy? Usually when there's a wide margin, we, we, we wouldn't, but. Uh, 
Everyone, please check your votes. Apologies, Ms. Zembury. Point of order? Ms. Evans? Now, Evans, Precinct 14, could you please um, announce very, very clearly when the speaker queue opens for this article? Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Yeah, after we scroll through all the vote screens, uh, we will clear the, the speaker queue for Article 3. Point of order? Point of order? Yeah. Okay, that should be the last screen. Yep. Matt Miller, Precinct 11. I waited one full second after the green light went out. I voted and it was counted. And it was counted. <laughs> this vote didn't. This vote was not significant. I figured I would just test it. Yeah. Just a comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the speaker queue is cleared and we have a few speakers already. So Ms. Ember, without further ado. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Could you please display? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Could you please display the slides? Yeah, switch over to the slides, please. Okay. Good evening. My name is Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. On behalf of the Board, I will be taking you through Warrant Article 3, an amendment of the zoning map, adopting the multifamily housing overlay districts, and amendment of the zoning bylaw. Next slide. After a year of public engage engagement, impassioned discussion, and ultimately mutual compromise, during a special town meeting on October 25th, 2023, Town meeting overwhelmingly voted to amend the town zoning bylaw to adopt zoning consistent with Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 3A, also known as MBTA communities. The vote consisted of 84% of town meeting members in favor of this change. In doing so, the town adopted two new overlay districts, the Neighborhood Multifamily Housing Overlay District and the Mass Ave and Broadway Multifamily Housing Overlay District. The Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities has reviewed the text of the zoning bylaw amendment in Article 12, passed at the fall 2023 special town meeting, and has not identified any issues with the text as submitted. Next slide. As a reminder, the MBTA community's legislation was created to provide at least one zoning district where multifamily housing, which is defined as three or more dwellings, is allowed by right and meets additional district requirements. Tonight, we will not be re-reviewing and debating the characteristics of the districts themselves. The only issue that is addressed by this article is the specific procedural adoption of the zoning map and the amendment of the zoning bylaw to procedurally include the map of the overlay districts themselves. Next slide. The town has been made aware that the, the Office of the Attorney General has procedurally required the town meeting separately vote to adopt the multifamily housing overlay district zoning map. As a reminder, during 2023 fall special town meeting, the zoning map and associated parcel lists were presented with the multifamily housing overlay districts and were reviewed, debated, and discussed at length. Special town meeting even voted to reject specific amendments to the zoning map. The proposed map and parcel list we are procedurally voting on today are identical to those that were presented to town meeting on October 25th, 2023, when town meeting voted to amend the zoning bylaw to adopt the new multifamily housing overlay districts. Next slide. The amendment for this warrant article includes, next slide, text that establishes the creation of the new overlay districts and adopts the map. Next slide. We have included for your reference a zoning map combining the base zoning map of the town and the new multifamily housing overlay districts. Next slide. And the last slide is the map of the multifamily housing overlay districts themselves. The parcel list is not included in this PowerPoint presentation, but is included in the vote language in your packages. The ARB voted four to zero at our April 29th meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 3. I'd now like to hand over the podium to our town council, Mike Cunningham. Mr. Cunningham.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the things we're doing here tonight. Um, last fall, the, town, the special town meeting approved this multifamily district. I received a call from the Attorney General's office when they were considering uh, the language of the text, the, by the zoning bylaw that we passed, and they suggested, in fact, uh, insisted that we include an amendment of the zoning bylaws, uh, the map specifically. I know that this body considered uh, the maps, was shown the maps, but the language itself did not contain the specifics that the Attorney General's office is looking for. Consequently, they agreed to extend the amount of time that they're going to use to consider that. So they have until June 22nd while, we can, while, this, board can, while this body considers whether to amend the zoning map. Uh, this does not change, as Ms. Zembray said, this does not change the district in any way. It's simply a, an affirmation through the zoning map of what this body did last fall. I note that on a parallel track, there was a procedural defect with the notice of the ARB's hearing last September, September 11, 2023. Uh, that was noticed at the time we filed these materials with the Attorney General's office. There was a posting period earlier this spring where there were 21 days for anyone who felt they were aggrieved by that failure. It was specifically uh, notice of the ARB's the September 11th meeting was not placed in a conspicuous spot in town hall. I know it was noticed a lot of other places, but that is a requirement. There was a claim filed objecting to the fact that that was not complied with. The Attorney General's office is currently considering that matter. It remains open. There's been some discussion about whether the, you know, they could waive certain procedures. They can waive the requirement that that was not posted if they determine that the individual who's made that claim was not prejudiced or deceived in any way. So that's what we're waiting for that. In the meantime, it was the most prudent course to consider this zoning bylaw amendment because if it passes tonight, we could potentially be done with the MBDA Communities Act. However, there's, a, there's certainly a, a the chance that the Attorney General's office um, determines that there is a, a grievance is valid. Um, based on the material that's been submitted, I think that is unlikely. However, I certainly want to make the, the body aware of what we're doing tonight, and this is potentially the last act taken. That's the background history. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Before I take speakers, um, I just want to point out um, uh, Ms. Zemberry and uh, Mr. Cunningham talked about kind of what, what, what the scope of this article is for debate. Uh, with all due respect, uh, there's only one person who's the judge of scope, and that's the moderator. That's me. Um, but I agree with them. Uh, whoever drafted the warrant article text hemmed this in pretty tight. Um, that one of the conditions that is consistent with the multifamily housing overlay districts uh, zoning approved by, town, by the town's fall special town meeting on October 25th, 2023. So we are not gonna have another four hour debate relitigating what we already debated for four hours in October. Hope that's clear. So let's go to the speaker queue now. Uh, we'll take Mr. Newton and then Ms. Evans. Ooh. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Uh, I, arrive this evening, I arise this evening to say a couple of things. First of all, to say, I'm sorry. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're taking up everyone's time tonight to revote the MBJ community's map. Uh, what we have in front of us, as you've just heard, is exactly the same map we voted at um, in the fall. There are no changes. Um, however, it is important to have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed, and you've already heard the town council explain the situation. Um, so we're here tonight at the request of the attorney general to confirm our vote from the fall, um, which brings me to the last thing I want to say to you, which is thank you. Um, as I have watched a few other communities struggle to come to agreement about their MBT, MBTA communities plan, um, I am heartened that thanks to your work and engagement, we were able to pass our plan overwhelmingly at town meeting last fall. Uh, the plan we passed together has received final approval from the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. We are one of only three communities who have achieved that milestone as of May 1st, um, alongside Lexington and Salem. Um, there is more that I could say, but in the interest of time, I will leave it there. I look forward to completing this procedural vote and getting our final approval from the Attorney General's office. Good evening. Thank you. Take Ms. Evans next, and uh, then Mr. Holman. Thank you. Winnell Evans, Precinct 14. Um, 
in the legal notice that was published um, by the Attorney General's Office in the Advocate and Star concerning the defect in the original public hearing notice, uh, which had to do with when and where those, those notices of hearings were published, uh, the notice states that written claims may be made that the notice defect was misleading or otherwise prejudicial. It goes on to say that, quote, if no claim is made, the Attorney General has the discretion to waive any such defect. If any claim is made, however, the Attorney General may not waive any such defect, end quote. So since a claim has been made, the possibility, even if unlikely, does exist that the AG may not approve the bylaw as it was voted last fall. So my question on the procedural nature of this vote is, number one, it seems that we are voting on an amendment to an article by voting on the map. Given that that article has not yet been approved, I'm wondering if we can do that, and if by some chance the AG chose not to approve this bylaw, will we then be revoting the entire article from the start? Thank you very much. Mr. Cunningham, do you want to address that? Thank you, Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Yes, we can vote on this bylaw, zoning bylaw amendment at this time. Uh, and yes, there is a possibility if, if the Attorney General determines that uh, the claimant was prejudiced or misled in the process by the failure of uh, the procedural defect that it wasn't placed in town hall, then yes, there is an opportunity. We, there is a chance that we'd have to redo the entire MBTA community's uh, bylaw. I, again, I think that's unlikely, and I'd stress it is pending. I spoke to the Attorney General's office today, and they re reaffirmed that they can grant a waiver upon consideration of the claim itself and the materials that the town has, has provided to them, demonstrating the amount of notices that were given to all citizens, including the claimant. Thank you. We'll take Mr. Hallman next, and then Mr. Greenspawn. Aram Holman, Precinct 6. I'm wondering if somebody could describe the exact precise nature of the notification that was sent to people in the affected area. The, and why, why do you believe that that's in scope? I'm sorry, say again? Why, why do you believe that, that that's in scope, the nature of the uh, notification? Because the issue is that one person uh, submitted a claim, I'd like to know whether other people uh, had a similar chance. I guess what I will ask is, uh, has the complaint about the public notification been remedied? Mr. Cunningham? Michael Cunningham, Town Council. I think I understand the question. Uh, the procedural defect that we were given notice of by the Attorney General's Office, that proper notice of that was provided, um, and there was a 21-day period when people had an opportunity to file claims. One, cl one such claim did arrive. That claim was provided to the Attorney General in accordance with the applicable statute. I think that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Yeah, Mr. Greenspawn. And then we'll, uh, we'll skip down to Mr. Klein. Um, Mr. Loretti has used all the speaking chips. For... Uh, Andy Greenspawn, Precinct 5. I move to terminate debate on the article. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to terminate debate and a second. All those in, for, uh, in favor of terminating debate on Article 3 of the special time meeting say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. No. It is a two thirds vote. Okay, we have one standing. Two, three, four, five. Okay, we'll take an electronic vote on termination of debate of Article 3. Okay, the green light is on. If you're in favor of terminating debate, press 1 for yes. If you want to continue debate, press two for no, or three to abstain. This is a two-thirds vote. Okay. 
Okay, let's close voting. Debate is terminated. 170 affirmative, 48 in the negative, one abstention. So we'll now proceed to a vote on the main motion of Article 3, which is the recommended vote of uh, the Redevelopment Board. It's a majority vote. And I'll, I'll describe it briefly as uh, we bring up the, uh, the vote for the main motion. Uh, the vote would amend the town's zoning map to adopt multifamily housing overlay districts and to amend section 412 and section 42 of the zoning bylaw to add those overlay districts consistent with the voting is now open, consistent with the overlay districts approved by the special town meeting in October of 2023. If you're in favor of that, uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no or three to abstain. This is a majority vote. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 180 in the affirmative, 36 in the negative, and seven abstentions. That takes us to Article 4. Um, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Before I begin, I'd like to ask for an additional three minutes. Reason for that is there's two other speakers. Um, Sarah Suarez, our Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development, and our Town Council will be presenting as well. Okay. Um, additional three minutes, you said? Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, do we have a second? Okay. So, we have a request for three additional minutes of speaking time for a total of ten. Uh, for a presentation. Uh, all those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. Uh, you have the 10 minutes, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the board <laughs> voted favorable action. It was a four to zero vote. Uh, Mr. Hurd recused himself from this vote, and this initiates the process for possible sale of town owned, town -owned property. It's a 5,000 square foot lot that's adjacent across the street from the Audison that was created when Acton Street was extended in 1963. Uh, Ms. Suarez will be making the presentation on the history of the property and, and the, the, the reasons for the request. And uh, Attorney uh, Town Council Mike Cunningham will be presenting the various stages that need to take place if there is a favorable vote. All right, thank you. Good evening, I'm Sarah Suarez, Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development for the Town of Arlington. I'm here tonight to discuss a parcel of land um, that's owned by the town. It's located behind the St. Athanasius Church along Acton Street and Appleton Place. This land is highlighted in red on the screen and sits just north of the Audison School. In 1963, the town extended Acton Street through the school property in order to connect it to Appleton Place. The road extension resulted in an orphan strip of land on the opposite side of the road from the school. This land is adjacent to the church property and extends the entire length of Acton Street extension. In 1970, the church requested permission to pass over the town strip of land to access the parking lot at the rear of its property along Acton Street. The town engineer investigated and made two recommendations to the select board at that time. Number one, that the entire strip of land be sold to the church via a town warrant um, at the 1971 town meeting. Or number two, that access be granted to the church to alter and use the strip of land as requested. While no article, warrant articles have been discovered related to this, it would appear the town chose to grant permission to the church for the church to cross over the town's land to access the parking lot. Next slide, please. There's been subsequent discussions about the town's land since then, and there is a renewed interest at this time because the church is in the process of selling its rear parcel along Acton Street and Appleton Place, which is bordered by the town's land. During discussions between the town manager, town council, and staff, it was determined that now would be the most opportune time to proceed with the disposition of land. 
On its own, the town land is just over 5,000 square feet and comprised of a triangular shape uh, at the corner of Acton Street and a long, narrow strip of land running the length of Acton Street towards Appleton Place. Next slide, please. Due to its unusual shape and limited square footage, this is an unbuildable lot on its own. There are no utilities on the site, no conservation restrictions, and there is limited financial value to this property as it is. However, it would be considered more valuable considering the adjacent land is now for sale. Next slide, please. I'll now turn it over to town council to discuss the legal, legal steps for moving forward with the disposition of land. Mr. Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, town council. First, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Deputy Town Council Jacqueline Munson and Peter Buckley from the legal department for all their work. This, this property has quite a bit of background to it. Uh, it was difficult to figure out what exactly was going on with it, but it's been discovered, I think it was known to some, but uh, it's under the care, custody, and control of the school department. So this is just another step in the process. This would not result in the immediate sale of the property. It, the bylaw went before the select board for hearing. It's before you tonight. Your vote is required, a two-thirds vote, uh, to move it ahead to the next step, which would be to send it to the school committee um, to, de to see if they wanted to declare this property surplus and are therefore available for disposition. It would then go back and be subject to a public bidding process if it is declared so. Um, the town could, would put that out to public bid. The town can consider bids, whether those are advantageous to the town. The town would be under no compulsion to sell it if those bids were not sufficient. Um, but then the select board would make a determination at that time. So tonight's vote would not be to dispose of this property immediately. However, it is a step in the process towards potential disposition. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. And I forgot to show and clear the speaker queue, so let's do that now. Okay. Can we clear that queue so we get a clean slate? Okay, you can now click in. Okay, we'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Morocco and then Mr. Griffin. Oh, is there a microphone in the balcony? Okay. Nope, can't hear yet. Nope. Uh, how about now? Yes, yep. there you go. Great. Uh, Edward Morocco, Precinct 11. Um, I wanted to um, rise to uh, suggest this not to be uh, put for, up for sale. Um, I have two children who went through Arlington Heights Nursery School, which is right there. Having the forest there was really nice. Um, also, I just think the loss of additional trees in the town wouldn't necessarily be desirable, in my opinion. I know that this wouldn't immediately result in a sale, but if you were to imagine that whole parcel going to somebody else, I would imagine that they would want to kind of probably cut those trees down and build something, but that's, yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Griffin and then Ms. LaCourt. Hi, uh, John Griffin, Precinct 19, and uh, I would uh, reiterate what, a little better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would reiterate what the first speaker said. Um, closer, okay. All right, um, so uh, yeah, I would reiterate what the first speaker said in that um, I do have, actually have one student, uh, one child at the Audison School, and, uh, and, and I, I drop her off on a regular basis, and uh, it is a very congested area, and I just wonder if, if nothing happens to that space, I, I think that would be a good thing. If it was developed in any way, I just can't imagine that there's, room for more activity there, so I would, I would um, prefer that the town retains rights to it and really just continues to do nothing with that, that uh, land. Thank you. Thank you. And just to, before we take Ms. LaCourt, uh, you can make your way up if you want. Uh, just a reminder that if you wish to reiterate what the previous speaker said, there's a process for that. You can vote the same way as them. Ms. LaCourt. <laughs> Annie LaCourt, Precinct 13. Everybody hear me okay? Great. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Moderator, I have a question that I believe should be directed to the Director of Finance, um, which is about um, what we would do with the funds if we did dispose of this property. Um, do we have someone who can answer that? Yep. Uh, Mr. McGee. Thank so. you, Mr. Moderator. Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager and Finance Director. Um, under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 63, uh, the sale of real property, real estate, um, will be reserved as a receipt reserved. So that means that it'll be segregated from the general fund into a separate fund and earmarked for a specific purpose. Um, so funds would then be proposed for use and then appropriated and approved by town meeting. So let me make sure that I understand what that means. That means that we would be selling an asset. We would reserve the value of that asset that could then be applied to the purchase of another asset or to offset debt or for some other purpose that would be appropriate for one-time money. That is correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take uh, Ms. Popova next and then Mr. Stephen Moore. Um, hi, um, I'm Marina Popova, I'm Precinct 13. Um, first, I wanted to tell you like two things that happened kind of in my mind today. First is I've got this... Uh, Maybe um, closer to the microphone. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first thing is uh, I've got that CSO alert. I don't know if any of you are getting that. Is the, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, overflow, the LOI for overflow. Um, so, and I was thinking, man, you know, when are we going to finally fix that? Uh, and then I was thinking about the Mugar land. Remember the Mugar, you know, and, you know. Yeah, we're so not talking about is, the Mugar. No, it is related. That's why, because one of the reasons why is people are fighting so much for the Mugar land, and there's like so much support from actually pretty much a lot of people in town, is because they want to preserve trees and they, to, they want to be able to absorb more water and you know, fix the problems with flooding that are resulting in those CSO alerts that we just got today. So, and the main question that is usually asked when, you know, in those hearings about the Mugar land was, you know, if everyone in town really wants to fix that, why is not town helping us more to, you know, to, to do something and stop the development in that, you know, Mugar land. And the answer usually is, well, the town well, cannot sir, do... Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, Ms. Popova, uh, you've said the word uh, Mugar, I think, about seven times now. I haven't heard the word Acton. Yes. You're speaking, can, you, can, you, can you pull sorry. it back into the scope yes. of the article, please? Yes, so the answer to that question is usually is because the town does not own that land. That's why we cannot do anything and we cannot fix that. So now we have this land at Acton, which town does own, which means that we don't need to do anything to actually preserve those trees and be able to absorb the water and kind of prevent the problems that we see right now happening around. Uh, and the other point is with this Acton land, I mean, if you reserve it as the open space that we have so little right now left in Arlington. Could not, for example, our schools like Otterson benefit from that? There are kids there, you know, they can to certainly utilize some of the open space and do some natural programs. The other school nearby. So what I'm saying is that maybe we could think a bit more about how the Arlington community could benefit from this land before we try to sell it. That's my only point. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stephen Moore next and then Ms. Dre. Thank you, Mr. Mod Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Moore, Precinct 18. Uh, I have no children at Audison or the nursery school there. However, I am a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. Uh, I'm not speaking uh, for them tonight. However, I do want to echo what uh, Ms. Popova had to say and the other speakers in that we should not be selling off land uh, unnecessarily that represents some of the diminishing open space that exists in town. This one has trees on it. The trees is something that should be retained. I would like to ask through you, do we have an idea of the value of this land if it was to be sold, Mr. Monterey? Uh, can anyone answer that question? Mr. Feeney? 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Feeney, town manager at the property, has not yet been appraised. But either way, the ultimate value would be determined by the bids that are received during the public bidding process. Okay, that, that part I understand. However, we don't even have an estimate or a guess. Not at this time, no. Okay. I would like to suggest that the value of this land is greater if it's left as open space with some form of vegetation, trees, whatever on it. Uh, if that property is developed behind it uh, that the church is wanting to sell, it will probably be populated with some form of building or structure, diminishing what open space is around in town, and I think we should retain this. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Ms. Dre, and then Mr. Foskett. Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. I'm wondering if it would be possible to learn why uh, Select Board member uh, Mr. Hurd recused himself from this vote? Uh, Mr. Hurd, do you want to explain? John Hurd, member of the Select Board. I'm representing in my law practice one of the entities involved in the transaction on the development. Thank you. And I so can't get in much more than that. So do you have an idea what the value of the property is? Um, I don't. Point of order. Jim DiTulio, Precinct 12. If Mr. Hurd has recused himself, he should not be participating in this debate or answering these questions. I, and I, I feel like we're putting him in an unfair position. Thank you. Yeah. You don't have to answer that question, Mr. Hurd, and this is not a cross-examination in the courtroom. Thank you. Um, so I would just reaffirm that trees are assets as well as property, and the price as the MasterCard commercial goes, is priceless. Thank you. No commercial advertising in here, please. We'll take Mr. Foskett next. Pass. Uh, Mr. Klein. And then Mr. Well, we just had Mr. Greenspan. We'll skip to Mr. Rudick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I have three questions, the second of which has already been answered, that we have no idea how much this land is worth. Um, and I, I think it's unfortunate that we do not have an assessed value and we're being asked to approve the sale. Um, the second is that uh, it was stated by the Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development that the town granted a right of crossing on that piece of property for the church. Does that transfer with the land sale? Mr. Cunningham? Michael Cunningham, Town Council, no, it does not. Okay. So whoever purchased the, the land from the church would not be able to take advantage of that strip of land without a separate agreement with the town. Um, and the third question is, has the town considered purchasing the land from the church as opposed to selling this piece of a parcel? Uh, I believe that's out of scope. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. That would be a great question for the select board. Um, Let's see, so we had, I think, Mr. Rudick next, and then Mr. Ruderman. Oh, we just recently had Mr. Rudick, didn't we? Okay, well, I'll let it pass this time, go ahead. Hey, um, Ben Rudick, Precinct 5. Um, I have been in commercial real estate for 15 years, uh, not around here, worked on all sorts of projects all around the world in the US, including land acquisition. I have some questions about how, um, as a benevolent capitalist on behalf of the town of Arlington, we're gonna maximize value in the sale. Um, so first question, who is in charge of running the disposition process? Ms. Uh, Cunningham, do you have an answer? Michael Cunningham, Town Council, I don't think there's a person in charge. The next step in the process, if favorable action is received here tonight, would be the school committee. They need to declare it surplus. Okay, got it. And then if it is declared surplus, then who takes over the process? It would go out to bid, and then it would be subject to approval from the select board. Got it. So there'd be a, a public uh, bid process after that, and then that sale price would be approved by the select board. Um, you mentioned that the other parcel is being sold by the church. Right? Is that a currently 
a sale process that's undergoing or that's uh, happening right now? Do we know? I have no knowledge of what's going on with those parties. Okay, no, no, no actually, this is actually important um, because um, I want to understand that there is an intelligent process by which we are disposing of this land. The reason being is if we get it wrong, we get effectively nothing. So for instance, um, slight digression, um, if the person who buys the site, the, the church site, right, that parcel is worth quite a bit to them, but it's worth nothing to anyone else effectively. And they'll be able to bid whatever is the minimum amount that is minimally acceptable to the town to clear that sale. Um, however, um, my question is, is there a mechanism by which we could coordinate with the church on a collective disposition because those two parcels together, and not just as a public bid, but brokered by like a professional brokerage, would generate by far the most proceeds for the town. Uh, putting aside whether or not this is a good idea to sell this thing, if we want to maximize dollars for Arlington, it would be a process that is coordinated with the disposition of okay. the church parcel okay. through the, professional so process. So the, 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 the strategizing around that would be an excellent thing to bring up at a select board hearing? Okay. Uh, but we're this is, uh, uh, the scope here is giving the select board the authority to make that deal. Understood. I my, guess my question is, is there even a process by which we could engage in such strategy, or is the only thing that can happen that we, this has to go for a public bid that will occur long after the church parcel is sold? Mr. Cunningham? It's B. I mean, this is property subject to cust care, custody, and control of the school committee, but it's town-owned property, so we must comply with uh, General Laws Chapter 30B. Okay. Probably not going to get a lot of money. All right. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ruderman, and then we'll take uh, Mr. Rowell. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. So there have been no discussions about uh, disposition of this parcel with the school committee yet? And, and, and we don't know if they have an antipathy towards, towards um, you know, giving it up that would make all of this moot? Well, actually, I'm going to call the scope on that. Uh, okay. Because Fine. Hmm? Next question. Um, I did hear Mr. Feeney commit to um, an open bid process, and that's great for establishing, you know, a market price. If there is a robust set of bidders. In this case, it's likely that we may get one bid. Only one bid. One bid does not set the marketplace. Mr. Feeney, can someone tell me that we're going to get a real appraisal of this property before it goes out to bid so that if it turns out that we only get one bid on the property, we know if it's a fair bid? Again, that determination would be by the select board, correct? Mr. Feeney? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yes, we would pursue, pursue a professional appraisal and in this instance, I think what might be helpful is to understand that that method would be by the contributory value, right? So the parcel in and of itself, it's basically land of low value because no one could do anything with it. But if that were coupled with the existing parcel, that, remain, that resulting value is worth far more than the sum of the parts. So we would pursue that method to make sure it was not uh, undervalued. But again, if you only get one bid and it is not favorable, you, nothing locks you into accepting a bid. Thank you, that's all. Okay, Mr. Rowell next, and then uh, we'll take Mr. Tosti. Hi, good evening, uh, Chris Rowell, Precinct 21. Uh, Mr. Moderator, my question is, um, well, first I'll make a statement. I'm hoping we just vote this thing no, but ahead of that, uh, is it possible to have an amendment made to give this land to the Conservation Commission? To give the land to the Conservation Commission? Yeah, I mean, so let's let or or uh, deed it as such land that it's only conservation land from this point forward. It seems like we all, uh, a majority of us, seem to be speaking towards the need for trees, green um, space. So I'm not a domain expert in that space, but that would be quite a task to fit that into like roughly 20 words of an amendment from the floor. Is such an expert here? Uh, point of order, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, Paul Schlickman, chair of the school committee. As the parcels under the domain of the school committee, um, I don't know that town meeting can just uh, 
transfer ownership under this article, so that, that's the question I'm asking. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so so if, that, if it's not yeah. possible to, to make the land conservation land and keep it in per perpetuity, then I, I would suggest we vote no. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and apologies for pronunciation of your name, Mr. Raul. Um, Mr. Tosti? Al Tosti, Precinct 17. I move the question on all issues involved with this article. Okay. We have a motion to terminate debate, and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 4 of the special time meeting say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. No. Debate is terminated. We'll, move to, we'll proceed to a vote on the main motion of Article 4, which is a two-thirds vote. And while we're bringing up the vote screen, I'll just summarize that the vote here is to authorize the select board to declare available for disposition a parcel of town-owned, voting is open, a parcel of town-owned land, and it's a two-thirds vote, uh, available for disposition a parcel of town-owned land along the northerly side of Acton Street subject to favorable action by the school committee and to authorize the select board to dispose of that parcel. You have 10 seconds to vote. It's a two-thirds vote. Okay, let's close voting. Okay, voting is closed. Ish. <laughs> and the motion fails. 79 in the affirmative, 137 in the negative, five ex uh, uh, abstentions. Uh, that takes us to Article 5. Um, we're almost, well, well Usually I would decide this myself, but I'll put it to the meeting this time. Um, all those in favor of uh, taking a 10 minute recess right now, say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. We are taking a 10 minute recess. Come back in 10 minutes and we're gonna be sharp about that. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, we are back in session. Everyone find your, your seats and settle down. And Article 5 of the special town meeting is now before us. Ordinarily, the chair of the board or committee with the report that contains the recommended vote would introduce it, but we don't have a recommended vote this time. I don't think this has happened for many, many years. Um, um, and so we need a main motion. We don't have a main motion in front of us. We don't have a recommended vote from a board or committee. And so I am inviting up the a town meeting member uh, who has been working with the petitioner of the citizens petition um, Ms. McKinnon, and she will introduce the main motion under this article. Ms. McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes. Or can, can Thank you. Closer to the mic, maybe? Small fist. Uh, my name is Sarah McKinnon, Precinct 20. I move that my motion be the main motion. Okay, we have a second. We now have a, a main motion in front of us. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I ask that three more minutes be added to my speaking time. Uh, Mr. Salomon and I would like to speak. We don't think we'll use it all, but we just don't want him to be cut off at the very end. Okay, so do we have a second? Okay, and this is for a three-minute extension? Yes, please. On the seven minutes for a total of ten. And we have a second. All those in favor of giving Ms. McKinnon and her guest uh, presenter um, uh, an extra three minutes um, in case they need it. Say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. It is approved. You have 10 minutes. Thank or, you. Yeah. Mr. Moderator, I ask that Mr. Chadi Salamoon, a resident of Arlington, be permitted to speak. Okay, he's a resident of Arlington, as you said, so he has the right to speak. The story of this resolution began with Arlington residents calling their elected representatives forming phone banks, meeting monthly with Catherine Clark's staffer at Robbins Library, 
participating in standouts and marches, and banding together across Congressional District 5 to speak with Representative Clark and Senators Warren and Markey's staffers, including in Washington, D.C., presenting them with a ceasefire petition signed by hundreds of Arlingtonians. We were told by our reps that there was nothing we could say that would affect or impact them. So we turned first to the Arlington Human Rights Commission, then the Select Board, and now to you, with the hope of adding our call for a ceasefire to the calls from countless cities and towns across the United States. When Arlington residents first approached the AHRC for a statement similar to those they have issued about many other global crises in the past, we were told it was not the best or most appropriate place. However, the AHRC and DEI Director Jill Harvey created a process, and hundreds of impacted residents participated in four listening sessions and wrote letters. The AHRC took all of this feedback and created a report that shared their findings, as well as suggestions for actions that came directly from the community. The AHRC has endorsed this ceasefire resolution to town meeting. They didn't need to. They had the ideas for action. They'd heard the division, and they'd heard the hurt. And so I hope everyone here pauses to consider that they did. We then went before the select board twice. They heard dozens of testimonies and received hundreds of letters from impacted residents who had never contacted them before. The select board then ruled no report, an uncommon decision, explaining that the select board is not the best or most appropriate place, but that town meeting was as the body for the people's voice. And now here we are in town meeting with so many community members who have been personally touched by this conflict, inspired to write to you, asking for some collective support for a ceasefire, for the return of hostages, and for an end to a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And once again, the question is asked, is this the best and most appropriate place? My question, on behalf of the hundreds of community members who have done everything they can, they have checked every box the system has required of them, is this. Where is that best and most appropriate place? If it doesn't exist, then perhaps we need to consider this moving forward. But for tonight, town meeting, a body who consistently votes on aspirational resolutions and has for hundreds of years, is the best and most appropriate and only place we have left. We are inviting you into solidarity to amplify our smaller voices and to recognize, as we have through the AHRC process, that complex global problems are also complex local problems. Many Arlington residents want to talk about this. Many town meeting members want to talk about this. I wish more of you had been able to attend one of the conversations that we held for town meeting members over the past three days. There were all kinds of opinions and beliefs and convictions brought, but we all centered on human dignity first. And we learned a lot that we didn't know about each other. I'm humbled by these conversations and I'm hopeful. What brought us to this place of conversation and deep, slow, intentional community building that can hold our fears, our pain, and our differences was facilitated by the process of seeking an Arlington ceasefire proclamation. It has cracked the painful silence in Arlington, and I ask that you support and affirm this first step in our healing. Good evening. Uh, name and uh, name, please. Chadi Salamoun. I'm here tonight to implore you to pass Article 5. Many, have, many of you have asked me why I think this article is appropriate in town meeting. I think the most honest answer I have is in the form of a question. What would you hope a small town in Gaza would do for you if your children were buried under the rubble of the Thompson School, if they were slowly starving to death 
in front of your own eyes, or if your own mother was dying from cancer and did not have access to medical treatment she needs to die with dignity and without pain. That's really the question before us tonight. What do we owe each other? What responsibility do citizens and local governments have in times of deep moral crisis, particularly when their national government plays a significant role in that crisis? Please understand that town meeting is not where I expected to find myself tonight, vulnerable, desperate, begging my local officials who I do not know to please help me. Help me advocate for children trapped by gut-wrenching violence. Help me to stop the bleeding, the cries of hunger, to please hear us because we are screaming so loud. I know some of you believe this article is divisive. I have to tell you I'm a little perplexed by this sentiment. This town was already divided. The only difference was that before this resolution, one group suffered in utter silence. Now Arlington is talking about it. While this article may make us feel uncomfortable, I'm quite certain ignoring the problem is not the right path forward. It's not going to help us heal as a community. It's not going to bring us together if we pretend we really have no responsibility to do what's uncomfortable but morally right. I understand that some of you believe that resolutions are meaningless. I can't disagree more. They are incredibly important. Last year, I introduced a warrant article asking the town meeting to urge the State House to change a state flag that's injurious to indigenous people. I asked you to imagine what it must feel like for an indigenous child to walk into an Arlington school with that flag flying overhead. This resolution is similar. It tells Palestinian and Arab children that they do not walk alone, that they have the validation from the Arlington community to the pain that burns on the inside, but no one can see or feel but them. I know some of you are worried how a yes vote may make some people feel. I ask you to consider what the silence of the last seven months has felt like to many residents. If tonight Arlington chooses to turn away from this article, I ask you to reflect what tomorrow will feel like for the Palestinian and Arab residents of Arlington who wake up to the realization that Arlington won't stand up to acknowledge our humanity during our darkest hour. We're shut out of the democratic process at the federal level. And I understand that there is a no action amendment tonight that seeks to do the same. From DC to town meeting, we will have no voice, no place where we can talk about our suffering. Tonight is our 12th meeting with town government on this matter. Many of us have worked on this every day for the past four months. Whatever you do tonight, however you decide to vote on the main motion, I ask you to vote no on the man substitute motion. It will make us invisible. Please allow us the dignity of a vote. If town meeting isn't the right place for this article, then I must ask, where should we go? Finally, I encourage you to reflect on the language used in resolutions in other cities and towns and appreciate how much care we've taken to create a document that really seeks to bring us together to advocate for what we really value in Arlington, human rights, human dignity. These are the values that can help us navigate our way forward together. But first, you have to do your part to communicate to our representatives that Arlington says no to violence and yes to a ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll take uh, uh, Mr. Sinesha, who has an amendment to offer. Um, is this audible? 
this is Rajiv Soneja, Precinct 2. Um, Mr. Moderator, I move the motion for town meeting to consider this amendment. Okay, we have a motion for the Soneja amendment. We have a second. It is now before us, pending on the main motion. Go ahead. Right. Um, may I also invite David Fleeg uh, to speak to this amendment after I am done? Okay, and are they a resident of Arlington? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, just, uh, your name, please, sir? Your name, please, for the record. David Fleig. Okay, proceed. Thank you. Um, uh, I propose this amendment to add a whereas clause to the main motion. Whereas we, as members of the Arlington community, must also acknowledge the actions of Hamas and the state of Israel to do not reflect the views of Arab, Muslim, or Jewish people in Arlington. I am a member of the Arlington Human Rights Commission, and though I speak here in my capacity as a uh, town meeting member. At the Human Rights Commission, we held four meetings between March 20th and April 24th that discussed the events in Israel and Gaza. We also held four listening sessions to be able to hear everybody opine about these events. Um, many of the comments we heard and read reveal the depths of pain and suffering that the residents have experienced, some very personal. Some comments, though, leaned dangerously towards dehumanization and marginalization of individuals and tied actions by certain entities like Hamas and the State of Israel to the collective identities of Muslim and Jewish people. Each of us here has been an outsider at some point in their lives, in some sphere of their individual uh, lives. I know what it means to be an outsider. My grandfather's family was part of the largest, one of the largest mass migrations in human history. And I speak from personal experience as a child of refugees and now as an immigrant to this country. I know what it means to feel like an outsider and to be associated with the stereotype. Being seen and heard as an individual is the most human and welcome emotions that enables a sense of belonging within a person. Just as we aspire for ourselves to be considered as individuals, this amendment recognizes the need for everyone within the community impacted by this conflict to be viewed as individuals and human beings. This amendment reflects what we heard from a diverse segment of Arlington community, many faiths, a multitude of ethnicities, many nationalities, and differing immigrant status. The addition of this clause makes it explicit that we believe that actions by some do not reflect collective identities. The intent for this amendment is aspirational, and it is put forth for the entire community. Please join me in voting yes for this amendment. Now I invite David to speak. Hello, I hope everyone can hear me. My name is David Fleig. I am a resident of Arlington and a part of the team which drafted the resolution. In order to explain why I want you to support this amendment, I feel obligated to give a brief history of how we drafted the article. When we started to write, we looked at the resolutions that have been passed by the Massachusetts cities of Somerville, Cambridge, Medford, Melrose, Greenfield, Northampton, East Hampton, and the town of Amherst. Unfortunately, in that process, we missed resolutions of some important groups. We didn't consider that cities outside of the U.S. would send ceasefire resolutions to our federal government. We didn't look at the ceasefire resolutions passed by the many native nations within our country. I support this amendment which addresses this omission. I don't have time to read all of them. The insights of Belfast, Ireland, the Red Nation, the Ossetti Nation, the Diné, Mohawk, Osage, and other groups. However, there is one line in particular that I want to highlight. Finally, be it resolved that the Ossetti Sakowin Treaty Council advocates for the dignity and safety of residents in every community. Regardless of what crimes its leadership may commit, commit, and that peaceful diplomacy is the only way to achieve this safety and dignity. 
Gregory Stanton, the founder of Genocide Watch, defined the 10 stages of genocide, several of which directly inform this amendment. Stage one, classification. Groups in a position of power will categorize people according to ethnicity, race, religion, or nationality, employing an us versus them mentality. Stage four, dehumanization. The diminished value of the discriminated group is communicated through propaganda. Parallels are drawn with animals, insects, or diseases. Please support this amendment as falsely equating all members of a group with either their leadership or their most violent, violent members is a key step in the process required to deny calls for a ceasefire and the work to support human rights for all people. This amendment supports the key distinction between Jews anywhere and the Israeli government, Palestinians and Hamas. It emphasizes what I hope, and what I hope will be affirmed tonight, a core value of our town, best said by Martin Luther King Jr that we be judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. Thank you. Thank you. That brings up uh, Ms. Mann to introduce um, the substitute motion by uh, Ms. Mann and a few other town meeting members, but Ms. Mann will be representing. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Nora Mann, Precinct 20. I come before you to move substitute motion of no action on article number five. Second. Okay, we have a second. It is now pending before us with uh, the Sinesia Amendment. The main mo motion on article five asks the town meeting to take a position on a war being prosecuted across the world. While the war is on the other side of the globe, like all diverse communities, it is one to which Arlington residents are deeply connected. They may have friends and family in Gaza and in Israel, and they may also be grappling with their personal feelings of conflict, fear, and trauma. I acknowledge and affirm that pain. In short, our town is deeply divided. I stand here in support of a substitute motion of no action because I believe that being forced to take an up or a down vote imposes a false binary and will exacerbate the existing pain and division in our town without having an appreciable effect on the lives of children and families in Israel and Palestine. And I offer this to give voice to those town meeting members who would otherwise feel that they must abstain entirely. I want to acknowledge that any position that town meeting takes on the main motion will deepen the pain of a large number of our neighbors and friends. These include people who have felt unseen and under threat and those who love them. As a result, I believe that the town's role in this context should be to help residents rise above their divisions and nurture an environment of kindness, understanding, and mutual respect. Along with the other proponents, I believe that a vote in favor of the substitute motion of no action respects the nuance of a complex foreign conflict and places a priority on the health of our town. So what is different about this motion and simply voting no on the main motion? As a purely personal matter, I agree with the merits of the resolution. However, on principle, I do not think that the Arlington Town Meeting is a place to debate weighty and complicated matters of world and foreign policy that have no impact on actions taken here in town. Those supporting the substitute motion of no action may have different views on the merits of the resolution, but I believe agree on that overarching point. 
A vote in town meeting on this resolution is not a substitute for meaningful conversation about the war and its implications on our families and friends. Any town-wide discussion must happen in a space and with the facilitation necessary for any person to feel and be safe and to feel and be heard. And that is not Arlington Town Meeting. By taking a vote of no action, we are saying that we don't want to be forced to vote up or down on the merits. We are not dismissing the validity of the calls set out, and at the same time, we are not offering on behalf of our whole town a stamp of approval. I offer this substitute because it is what my principles guide me to do. I offer it as an option for each of us to vote our own principles and make one request that we each afford our colleagues the grace to believe that their vote is in good conscience and that their vote is not for or against a ceasefire, for or against death and trauma, and not for or against an issue that is at the same time dynamic, complicated, and tragic, and about which we, as the Arlington Town Meeting, have ha can have no real impact. I move the substitute motion of no action on warrant article number five. Thank you. Okay. We already did, um, we have a second on the substitute motion. Yep, and we do. So the substitute motion is now before us as well. So the motions have all been laid out. We've had all the speakers and I'm going to take as little time as I possibly can to explain things that I think are important here procedurally. Uh, first of all, if you look at the text of uh, the main motion, the McKinnon main motion. Uh, the second to last uh, paragraph, be it further resolved, that a copy of this resolution be sent to the offices of the President of the United States, Joseph Biden, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Ed Markey, and Congresswoman Catherine Clark. Um, resolutions are not self-executing. They can't send themselves, obviously. So I just want to uh, uh, ask if any town officials, since this is a non-binding resolution, are there any town officials who would feel compelled to follow through on that action? And uh, uh, Madam Clerk, and Madam Clerk um, can you just tell us a little bit briefly about the time frame and the manner in which you might do this so that the meeting can understand what, what actions might be taken? Julie Brazil, town clerk. Um, it usually takes um, 10 days to two weeks for me to finalize the paperwork to certify the votes and produce the copies. Um, if the uh, if the resolution carries and the proponents provide me with the list of names and addresses, I am happy to make those copies and send them uh, along. Thank you. And one last point I'll make uh, before we proceed to voting, because I'm also a reminder that there's no live speaker queue on this resolution, as I've announced in advance, because that's our policy that we've had for some time now for resolutions in general. Um, uh, Mr. Warden informed me before the meeting that at least the last three of my predecessors have not allowed substitute motions of no action. Um, so this is a novel uh, concept to town meeting. And I made the decision um, without consultation with the town meeting procedures committee. Um, I made, this is my decision that I made. I did not have time to convene that committee given open meeting law and the, uh, the, the notification timeframe. Um, from when we found out that there would be uh, no recommended vote. And so uh, just very briefly, uh, I, I get many questions about like, uh, why this is a lot, why is a substitute motion of no action allowed? And uh, uh, why, like, rather than just a no vote, uh, and also uh, why not just uh, have abst abstentions mean that someone thinks it's not appropriate to, to vote on this at town meeting. And there are technical reasons for that that I'm not gonna get into the details of here, uh, but in my view, in my judgment, resolution, the, the main product of a resolution is that town meeting is expressing its will about something. It's not about appropriating money. It's not about doing something that's concretely tangible. Um, it's about an opinion or the will or the values of the meeting in the aggregate. And, and again, it's not amending bylaws or anything that, that, that requires execution by a town official or a town body or a town entity or so on. And so because of that, I see that as a category difference from other types of articles. Um, and in this case, uh, in my view, there was a clear distinction between 
the, the, the opinion of being in opposition to the resolution in the main motion versus feeling that uh, it should not be voted up or down by town meeting directly. And, uh, and so as far as abstention, just very briefly, uh, abstentions mean that your vote doesn't count in the tally. So if we had 252 town meeting members and uh, 200 of them uh, abstained, for instance, hypothetically, then that means that only 52 are deciding. And you might say, um, well, 52 is less than quorum of 64, but quorum applies to those who are present, not those who are voting. And so you, would have a very, you could have a scenario where a very small minority of town meeting members end up voting yay or nay, which does not, in my view, express truly or accurately the will of the meeting. And so that's how we got here. So we will now take the um, votes on the motions in the order of, first we will take the Senesia amendment to see whether to apply that to the McKinnon main motion. After that, we will take a vote on the man's substitute motion. And that vote will decide whether the main motion, amended or not, will be replaced by no action. And then finally, we will take a vote on the resulting main motion of the previous votes. Uh, and th there's a number of different possibilities, and we'll address that vote by vote when we get there so that it's clear. So let's take up now, we have a point of order. Uh, a microphone so everyone can hear you. Andy Greenspawn, uh, Precinct 5. If the substitute motion becomes no action, can do people vote yes or no on no action typically? Saying if the substitute motion is affirmed and replaces the main motion with no action. Oh, wait. Okay, right. no, wait. Uh, which, which order? Sorry, I'm confused so about we, the So we order. first vote on the, we have to vote the subsidiary motions first and the main motion, which may be amended or substituted last. So it'll be the Senesia amendment first, and then, which will either get, so it'll either amend or not amend the, the McKinnon main motion into a new main motion, or, and, and then we move on to this, the substitute motion of no action, which is the decision on whether to replace the main motion with no action. And if we were to replace the main motion with no action, then are we then taking a yes, no, abstain vote on no action? Then we still have to take a vote on no action, and it is inconsequential at that point. Okay. Yeah, we have to take it anyway as a procedural formality. Okay. okay, so let's now proceed to a vote on the Senesia Amendment. So if you are in favor of the Senesia Amendment, adding a clause, voting is now open. Uh, the Senesia Amendment uh, adds a clause to the resolution. If you're in favor of that, press one for yes. If you're opposed and you wanna leave the McKinnon main motion uh, intact, unchanged, press two for no, and three to abstain. Again, an abstention does not count toward the, the, the yay, nay total. It's basically voting present. Okay, let's close voting. And these are all majority votes. And the motion passes 152 in the affirmative, 32 in the negative, 26 abstentions. So we now have the main motion as amended by the Senesia Amendment. Okay. And that now takes us to the man substitute motion of no action. So a yes vote here would mean that you replace the main motion with no action. We'll take a follow-up vote after that if that happens, but the follow-up vote is inconsequential. Uh, if you want to keep the main motion as amended by the Senesia Amendment, you'd vote two, uh, uh, two for, uh, for no. Well, let, me, let me restate that. If you, if, you, if you want to keep the main motion as amended by the Senesia Amendment, vote two on the substitute motion. Okay. So, okay, we're voting on the substitute motion. Press one if you want to substitute, if you want the main motion to be no action. Vote two if you want to keep the resolution as the main motion. And vote three to abstain, which will not count toward the vote tally.
That's closed voting. This is a majority vote. And the motion passes. 122 in the affirmative, 88 in the negative, five abstentions. So we now have a main motion of no action. And I'll do it, let's hold applause, please. Please. Uh, we'll just do a, vo a voice vote on this. Since this vote is inconsequential, the meeting has expressed its will by majority vote of no action. But we have to take a vote now as a format, procedural formality. And so all those in favor of no action, say yes. yes. All those opposed? Yes. It, is a, it is a no action vote, I so declare it. And that disposes of Article 5. Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move oh, that. Hold, hold on one second. Let's, let's, uh, let's try to keep it quiet as, as, as folks find their way out of the, uh, the hall, please. OK, let's try to keep our voices down until you get outside the chamber, please. Ms. Deschler. Mr. Moderator, I move that Article 1 be taken from the table. OK, we have a motion to remove Article 1 from the table. All the, do we have a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. It is now uh, off the table. Mr. Moderator, I move that the special town meeting be dissolved. OK, we have a second to dissolve, a motion to dissolve the, the special town meeting, and we have a, uh, a second. Um, all those in favor of dissolving the special town meeting, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. It is unanimous. The special town meeting is dissolved, and it is, uh, it, that takes us back to the annual town meeting. Um, that's one sec. Just give me a sec. Okay, let's go back. So we were at um, Article 31. Oh, right, I'm sorry, yeah, so let's see. So we had a motion earlier to postpone Article 22 until after the special town meeting. That's now happened, and so now Article 22 is before us. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy? Or Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. The Select Board moved favorable action by a four to zero vote. Mr. Helmut recused himself to authorize the Select Board to file home rule legislation to lower the voting age in local elections to 16 years old. Um, Mr. Moderator, we had asked to table this warrant article to allow the proponent, uh, Sophie Shenney, Arlington High School junior to make the presentation. Oh, actually, she's here. Okay, great. To make the presentation to town meeting just out of an abundance of caution. Uh, if I could have an additional three minutes for her presentation. And um, oh. I do want to note that she made a comprehensive presentation to us. We did hear also from Representative Garbally, who has filed legislation at the state level um, to lower the voting age in local elections across the Commonwealth to 16. But uh, okay, so, the, so, so we have a motion to, before we get into all that material, we have uh, um, a request to uh, extend speaking time for a total of 10 minutes. Yes. And we have a second. All those in favor of allowing um, a total of 10 minutes, three additional minutes, uh, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. Uh, we have, you have 10 minutes. Okay, and I'd like to invite Ms. Shen up to, to uh, make a presentation to town meeting. We found her presentation very compelling, very comprehensive, and uh, we appreciate her staying so late on a school night to come before the town meeting. Right, thank you. And, and Ms. Shen is a resident of Arlington, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, she is. Okay, then she has the right to speak. Ms. Shen, welcome. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sophie Shen. I'm a junior at Arlington High School. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm so happy to be speaking to you all today. I've recognized some familiar faces from precinct meetings, so that's very reassuring to me. 
Um, I'm here to talk to you about Warren Article Number 22, which would lower the municipal voting age to 16 years old, which means that all 16 and 17 year olds would then be granted the right to vote for uh, school committee members and for you all, town meeting members. Um, so basically what it would do is we would set up a separate voting list for 16 and 17 year olds so that they could vote specifically on town elections, but they would have to register for federal and state elections at 18 years old. Uh, next slide, please. So there are three main reasons why lowering the voting age would be beneficial to our town. The first is to improve civic engagement, the second is to improve civic education, and the third is to empower young people. Uh, next slide, please. So first we will be discussing improving civic engagement. Uh, next slide. So studies show that voting is a habit and that once someone votes in one election, they are more likely to vote in the next election. And so by lowering the voting age to 16 years old, we allow for this habit to be established earlier on. And this is especially crucial because 18 year olds are in a very difficult transition period of their life. A lot of them are going off to higher education or entering the workforce full time. And so voting absentee for their first election may po pose a barrier, especially because um, the voting registration is tied to a permanent address and young people are highly mobile. Uh, so vote lowering the voting age to 16 years old when uh, teenagers are still living at home in town, uh, allows for easier access to the ballot box and thus would promote young voices uh, at the ballot box. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, I'm going to discuss strengthening civic education. Next slide. Oh, you can see your slides on the side too. Oh yeah, thank yep. you. Um, so Tufts has done several studies on voter education, especially relating to young people. Uh, one of their findings is that black and Latinx voters are the least likely to make it to the ballot box and also the least likely to be encouraged to vote in high school. And so it's really important to talk about voting and encourage students to vote in high school because we see that they are more educated later on and they look upon voting more favorably. And so if we want to promote diverse voices in Arlington, which I know is a huge priority that we want to make sure that everyone's voices are heard, then it's super important that we uh, uplift minority voices. Uh, there are several other studies that have hap uh, happened at Tufts Circle. Um, I encourage you to look into them. They're super interesting about young voter demographics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and finally, I want to talk about empower young people who are ready to vote. Uh, next. So, going to talk a little bit about neuroscience here. 16-year-olds uh, uh, have fully developed their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so, while the full brain is not developed until 25 years old, cold cognition, which happens in that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and determines functions such as abstract thinking or uh, understanding a ballot, all those things that you would need in order to be a, an effective voter are fully developed by the time you get to 16 years old. Um, we also see that 16 and 17 year olds are about equal as older adults in terms of political understanding, efficacy, uh, because their cold cognition skills do not improve as uh, people age. And so this is uh, compelling scientific evidence to allow, for, to allow for 16 year olds to vote. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we also see that society has already reinforced a lot of these ideas by treating 16 and 17 year olds as adults in many cases. 16 and 17 year olds are allowed to vote, I mean not allowed to vote, I would hope they would be allowed to vote. Uh, they're allowed to work um, and sometimes they're tried as adults for legal cases and serious crimes and they pay taxes. Um, and so if we're allowed to drive, we're allowed to have a license, um, which in many cases is tied to voter registration. You're asked if you want to register to vote when you get a driver's license. Um, then I think that we should also extend the right to vote to 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this next section is about more common myths. Um, I hear a lot of arguments that 16 and 17 year olds simply won't take advantage of this opportunity even if it is granted to them. Um, yet I, personally am a member of the Model Congress Club at my school and we see that there's a, a high percentage of um, participation in politically related clubs at our school. We see that also on a larger nationwide scale, Harvard Model Congress, which is the conference we attend every year, is growing each year in interest. There's 
always over like 1.500, no, 1,500 participants um, in the conference each year. Um, and we also see that in terms of real world Im impacts, uh, protests are largely youth led, uh, protests for climate, and some of you may have been around for the Vietnam War, but protests for peace during the Vietnam War were also largely youth led. And so we see that young people are already really interested and engaged in political spheres. Uh, next slide, please. We also see that in Austria, whose voting age is 16 years old, that when 16 year olds were given the right to vote, they took that opportunity. And so it might be difficult to see from afar, but 16 year olds, um, their point estimate is only about 2% less than the voter turnout for older adults. Um, and the confidence interval actually includes um, values that are greater than the overall voter turnout for adults. Um, and so that provides convincing evidence that 16 and 17 year olds would take advantage of that voting rate. Uh, next slide, please. And our final common myth is that this would just be an extra vote for children's parents. Uh, you may recognize this argument from the women's suffrage movement, uh, anti-suffrage anti movement. Um, but we also see that in Scotland, who lowered their voting age for the uh, independence referendum, that teenagers are equally likely to vote the same as they are different from their parents. And so we would hope to see similar results in the United States if we were to lower the voting age. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, I do want to highlight some other efforts from around the country and around the world as a whole. Uh, if we were to lower our voting age, we would not be alone. Uh, several towns in Massachusetts have already submitted home rule petitions, such as Somerville, Cambridge, the city of Boston, um, around the country and the world. We see Austria and Scotland, which I previously mentioned, but also Brazil, Cuba, Norway, as being countries who have already lowered their voting age to 16 years old for even presidential elections. And so, if we were to lower the voting age for the town, we would actually not even be doing something extremely revolutionary. Um, Next slide, please. And so that is my last slide, but I would be happy to take any questions that people have. Is that allowed by the moderator? All right. Okay. So, uh, well, so I'll open a speaker queue and folks can come up and if they have questions for you, you can make yourself right. available. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, speaking of the speaker queue, let's, uh, I did not show this earlier, so let's clear the speaker, uh, yeah, let's clear the speaker queue. So folks, we can start with a clean slate. I'm not sure yet folks uh, clicked in over a period of several minutes. Okay, speaker queue is open. So why don't we start with, sorry, Mr. Lorette, let's start, start with Ms. Culverhouse. We'll get to you eventually. Uh, and then Ms. Kulinane. Uh, Lynette Culverhouse, Precinct 11. I rise in strong support of this article. I had a teaching career that spanned over four decades, teaching students of all ages. I can say with certainty that I always found students to have an acute sense of justice and fairness, and an ability to have clarity about what resonates with them. Young minds that haven't yet been conditioned to follow established rules that are not always fair or inclusive, understand what serves people well and what doesn't, because they see every situation with fresh, untainted minds. It is beyond time in my mind to break down the barriers of ageism and include our youth in decision-making, especially decisions that directly affect their lives. Arlington schools have a good civics program and I see no better way to support our students and schools than by giving 16-year-olds the vote and inviting them to become engaged in the civic life of our town. I hope you will join me in supporting this article. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kulinane, and then we'll take Mr. Stern. Skipping around a little bit just to offer some new voices, some airtime. Go ahead. One fist. <laughs> okay, uh, Joanne Cullinane, Precinct 21. Um, as a loving mother of a 16-year-old and a soon-to-be 19-year-old, I urge you to oppose a change to the voting age that would allow minors to vote in local elections. And I want to emphasize I am still a loving mom. <laughs> Having just watched one child emerge from childhood and begin to claim the responsibilities of adulthood, 
I am now watching another enter this all-important period of late adolescence. For this reason, I feel I have a unique vantage point from which to tell or remind you, as the case may be, that two years do indeed make a difference. As adults, we tend to think of two years as minimal, but the changes that take place in kids' minds and lives during this developmentally critical time period are huge, and that is why people who raise children often marvel at how radically their children morph from inherently peer-driven and somewhat self-centered <laughs> beings into individuals with vastly greater empathy and awareness of others. The transformation is simply astounding to watch. I applaud Sophie for her passionate interest in local issues. The fact that she brought this article before us is a testament to just how robust civics education in Arlington is. Arlington Public School students all take a year of civics in eighth grade, and I remember being impressed by the thoughtfulness of the curriculum when my son took it. Shout out to Mr. Backey at Audison Middle School. Unfortunately, students at the high school do not revisit civics, and I would Urge, argue that instead of having minors jump into the deep end, so to speak, we should petition the high school to incorporate civics into the curriculum more as students approach age 18. It should be incorporated across disciplines and subjects, subject matter, and the new discourse lab would be absolutely perfect for a mock town meeting. I oppose lowering the voting age to 16, and both of my kids do agree with me on this, for three reasons. One, the science shows 16-year-olds are still developing long-term planning, which resides in the prefrontal cortex and not done maturing until age 25. Two, while teens have access to lots of information on the internet, they have fewer life experiences than kids their age did even a few short decades ago. So they have little context within which to interpret the information coming at them. Three, allowing 16-year-olds to vote when their parents and 18-year-old siblings have voting rights gives families with children undue weight in local elections, and this, this introduces, for me, significant equity issues. As for science, um, the American Psychologist article by Lawrence Steinberg et al. that's often cited by proponents of, of this article state that 16-year-olds score as well as most adults in the realm of cold cognition or the ability to reason in settings where there's no pressure to act rashly, while they score significantly worse than adults on so psychosocial indicators. The author's argument is that these conflicting results explain the rationale of advocating for minors' right to make health, rights to make health decisions while opposing the practice of trying minors as adults in criminal cases. It's important to note that health decisions are highly personal matters and involve thinking about one's own well-being, whereas voting often entails thinking about what is best for others with whom one might share little in common. At 16, most teens um, have not emerged yet from the egocentric worldview that marks all of our childhoods, and their worldview is not as broad as it will be a few years later. This is important because voters are asked to weigh in on matters regarding taxes and budgets, and they have to consider how their votes will impact others. As a social scientist, I would note that Steinberg et al. downplay the artificiality of their tests. As social beings, our decisions can never be divorced from social and cultural context. The authors mention the limitations of lab-based testing and passing, um, and I have a long quote here, but I'm just gonna summarize. They say that they, um, they have try to divorce cold cognition from psychosocial aspects in their testing. Um, but in real life, these things are always intertwined. Decision making, as we've seen tonight, <laughs> is often emotional. This means cold cognition is never entirely cold, and it is much less cold among adolescents. Adolescents have a biological drive to fit in and put membership in peer groups above almost everything else. <laughs> While this is a natural part of growing up and something we've all experienced, experienced, it does not make necessarily for independent voters who are able to resist undue influence from others. Um, as for life experience, I just want to say 16-year-olds um, lack a lot of life experiences that I consider prerequisite for voting on matters that affect all residents in town. Uh, most employers no longer employ, sadly, kids um, 15 and under. So uh, my son who's 16 has been unable to find employment in town, has no significant experience with budgeting or money. Um, and 
I'm going to have to skip ahead here, equity. Another reason lowering the voting age is, age is problematic to me is that I don't find this equitable. Kids spend a lot of time in certain places and in certain activities, and parents spend a lot of time worrying about their kids. As such, there will be large areas of overlap when it comes to how they feel about schools, parks, sports fees, and other things of heightened in importance at this stage of their lives. Parents and children over 18 already have a vote, so if you expand the vote to minors in these same households, the voices of families with children are amplified, and those in town who are most frequently overlooked already are even more outnumbered. There's nobody we can enfranchise whose inclusion would amplify the voices of single people or the elderly in the same manner. This smacks to me of tipping the scales. I urge you to vote no on this article for these reasons, but to look for ways to encourage the high school to keep kids engaged after their introduction to civics in middle school. If we do that, then it is more likely these students will register to vote in larger numbers when they round the corner and turn 18. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take uh, Mr. Stern next and then Ms. Crowder. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Michael Stern, Precinct 14. I, I thought that Ms. Shen did a great job of um, giving us some ideas why, why it would be a, uh, helpful for um, 16 and 17 year olds to vote. I was just wondering if anyone knows if 16 and 17 year olds were to register and we were to allow them to vote, how many 16 and 17 year olds do we have in the town and what would their impact be on the total number of voters? Does anyone have that demographic information? Mr. Feeney or? Oh, uh, Ms. Shen? Hi. Um, so I've, I've had this question asked before and I've done a little bit of research. Our census data only cat, uh, categorizes in age ranges. And oh, so. Uh, yeah, it's a little closer to the microphone. Yeah, like Hello? a few inches Can away. Yeah. Is this good? Okay. Uh, our census data only reports in age ranges, but the uh, 15 to 19 category has about 2,042 people in it. So if we assume that the distribution of ages is equal, then we have about 800 added voters uh, that are 16 and 17 years old. And if we also look at Arlington High School's enrollment data, um, there are about, I believe, 700 students uh, who are enrolled in 11th and 12th grade. And so if we account for those who are attending minimum regional high school or private schools, then we would get around the same number of 800 new voters. Okay, and, and Ms. Brazil, there's like 34,000, uh, 32,000 32, voters. Okay, I just have one more question. I, and um, I, I wanna know, uh, you, you cited Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville as having proposals on the table to do this or they have already done it? Their town councils have all voted uh, to submit a home rule petition. And so basically all um, voting, all changes to voting law for towns have to go through the state. And so they've submitted them to the state legislature. It's still in the current session, but they haven't uh, passed in the state yet. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Crowder and then Mr. Lewicki. Elaine Crowder, Precinct 19. Um, I was wondering whether uh, we might have a reminder of the current requirements for running for office. And my question being, um, would anything about this article change uh, th those requirements? For uh, Mr. Cunningham? Like specific offices at a particular level, town offices or? Local offices, Local town offices. offices. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Monterey, Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Um, I've looked at this issue, and looked at chapters 51, uh, the regulations 950 CMR 57. In my opinion, no. Um, this creates a separate class of voters, the local voters. This would not entitle 16 and 17 year olds to run for office um, or otherwise participate and, and be true registered voters as those statutes contemplate. That they, they would not be registered voters as the, correct. Correct, they would not be registered voters the same as those who are 18 and over, and therefore would not be eligible in the same way for elected office. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, who did I select next? 
Oh, Mr. Lewicki, uh, who passed. Okay, um, Mr. Barr, and then Mr. Schluckman. There we go. There Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, Joseph Barr, Precinct 5. Uh, rise in support of the um, article. Uh, I just wanted to make two points. One, I'm not an expert in child development, but I am an expert in traffic safety. And I would just say that if we consider 16-year-olds to be sufficiently developed to wield a 2,000-plus pound vehicle that can kill people very easily, then I think we can also trust them with the franchise of voting. So that's why I'm voting in favor of this. The other reason is that you may recall during special town meeting uh, in the fall, uh, there was a young uh, person from Arlington High who spoke uh, in favor of the MBT MBTA Communities Act. That was my child, John Barr. And I just want to remind people, as a proud father, the quality of, of students we have at the school, including Sophie Chen, and that those are the kinds of people we'd be allowing to participate in our civic democracy. And I think we should all support that. Thank you. Thank you. At least, at least those students should be able to vote, right? Mr. Schlickman. <laughs> Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, and Chair of the School Committee. First of all, I want to acknowledge the fact that we do an ex excellent job on civic education within the Arlington Public Schools. For the past two years, I have participated in Civics Day at Odison, and the thoughtful questions that were asked to a wide variety of people, uh, our state rep, state senator, uh, myself, the superintendent of schools, and a bunch of other people in other rooms that I didn't get to see, uh, it's just extraordinary. They're very thoughtful questions. And while we do not have a class called civics, uh, we have a lot of civic engagement within our high school, and we do see those students coming to us with issues that they want us to address. Now, as somebody who's run for office in this town a few times, I note that when we have a town election, and remember this, this uh, only applies to town elections, not federal or state elections. We have, on the low end, maybe 10% of the voters coming out if it's not a particularly hotly contested election. Normally, we're around 18, 20%. Maybe if there's something really interesting happening, we're pulling in the 20s, and if it's really hot or there's an override on the ballot, we're getting up to 30, okay? 16 and 17 year olds are going to act just like we do. There's, there's going to be a subset of them who are engaged civically, very aware of what's going on, just like the first speaker on this article, who want to get engaged in local government. 17 and 18, and most of them probably won't, and maybe if they do, it could be a good thing because they're the ones who are going to have to live with the results of what we do long term. And we want them well trained and thoughtful voters. And if they have the right to vote in local elections, I will guarantee you at the high school level, we will have forums for students who are eligible to vote to meet the candidates and learn the issues. It's our responsibility to do that. I cannot see how a core of about 816 and 17 year olds are going to so overpower the votes of their adult compa uh, companions that they are a threat to our election. And in fact, if they have an out a more outstanding rate of participation in our local elections than the adults, maybe that's a message we should send to the adults and get them to the polls. Please vote yes. Thank you. I'll take uh, Mr. Kepline and then Mr. Jalkit. I should have had them race. You would have won Mr. Jalkit. <laughs> he had a head start. Uh, Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Uh, I did have a couple of questions. So I'm wondering um, how would a minor uh, established residency or proof of residency in Arlington? Do they have utility bills or leases that they could use? Um, 
Mr. Cunningham, do you have an answer to that? How does a minor establish residency? All right, settle down, everyone. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. I'm not sure explicitly, but it'd be probably the same way in which they establish their residence for purposes of getting a driver's license. So, um, so a student would need to actually get a driver's license in order to be able to register to vote. I'm just not sure of the exact paperwork required to get a driver's license, but whatever that is would be probably similar to be what would be required to demonstrate residency for purposes of voting registration. Okay, uh, in a related question, uh, when they do get a driver's license, the state offers them the option to register to vote, or for 16-year-olds and up, they can pre-register to vote, and the state maintains a list of these, these people. Um, would the town list be the same as that, or would it be a separate list, or there's any interaction between the lists? My reading of the proposed home rule petition would they be a separate list maintained by the town, local okay, voters. Thank you. And would that list be a matter of public record? Yes. Okay, so 16 year olds, currently 17 year olds are known as real persons and they are a matter of public record. Um, but now 16 year olds would be on a voter list and their date of birth and address and any party affiliation would become a public record. Oh, I'm Ms. sorry. Ms. Brazil says uh, no party affiliation would be associated with the 16 and 17 year olds, correct? Okay, so, so then for people local. running for office can use this public information to contact kids and, and ask them to vote for them, I suppose. I don't, I don't know what public officials would do, but uh, or people running for office, but this is, it would be a public record subject okay. to discovery. And would um, participation in elections, would that be recorded also? So I know who the frequent voters are? Ms. Brazil says probably. Okay, thank you. Um, I still have concerns about privacy and, and opening up 16-year-olds to, to being, uh, have their information available as public record. Um, and I do question um, judgment, you know, it's, there's so many TikTok challenges and I'm not impressed with uh, the decision making on those who take part. And even those who camp out on college campuses you know, most of us don't do that sort of thing. Yeah, that's, that's out of scope, Mr. Kepline. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I'll take Mr. Jalkett and then Mr. Miller. Maybe, maybe voting would be a TikTok challenge. That'd be cool. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel Jalkett, Precinct 6. Um, I normally wouldn't share my age, but I'm 48 years old, which means that I've been voting for 30 years. Um, every year of those 30 years, as far as I can recall. Um, but I'm here sort of speaking on behalf of my 16-year-old self because when I hear people denigrate 16 and 17-year-olds as if they're so incapable mentally that they would not even be given the opportunity to express themselves in a civic sense, that 16-year-old me is offended. And I think anybody in this town who feels similarly to how I did, any 16 or 17 year old in this town, would be similarly offended if they knew that people were making blanket dismissals of their ability to reason uh, public, publicly debated issues. Um, so I guess it's obvious I support this uh, measure. Um, when I was 16, not only did I want to vote, I wanted to run for public office. So I made a promise to my friends that as soon as I'm 18 years old, I'm gonna run for city council. And as it happened, the schedule of city council elections in my hometown of Santa Cruz, California, didn't allow me to run until I was 19. But when I was 19, I did run. So I'm a little unusual in that my precociousness was strong enough not only to want to vote, but to participate in, as a representative. Um, 
But I would ask anybody who harbors doubts about the intelligence or the cognitive ability or the interest of 16 and 17 year olds to participate, uh, maybe you just haven't met the right 16 and 17 year olds. And the same way, we all know people that even though we respect and accept their right to vote, we kind of wish they didn't because <laughs> they're not doing it right, so to speak. Um, you're going to run into some people in this world who, you know, use their privileges in ways that you kind of wished they didn't. But I agree with the assessments that, on the whole, 16 and 17-year-olds are comparable to 18 and 19-year-olds when it comes to, you know, the likelihood that they would be engaged and knowledgeable and willing to participate. Um, and I think if you can think of maybe the most impressive 16-year-old you can recall engaging with, and then think of the least impressive 18-year-old you can recall engaging with, would you, if you could, grant them the opportunity to switch rights? Um, Vote swapping is not in scope. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. I just want to also add, um, there's this kind of like generally applicable mindset, as far as I'm concerned, that when you work as a society, as a government, to expand liberties, you're probably doing the right thing. Uh, unless there's an overriding reason not to extend rights to particular people. Um, let's just say there's more mistakes made going the other direction than this direction. So I encourage you to vote for this article. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll take Mr. Miller and then Mr. Wagner. Hi, Matt Miller, uh, Precinct 11. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, so I'm going to be brief. I, you can take three minutes off of my time. Uh, actually, all I got to say, it, a lot was said. And what I think is that I talked to some parents who had more than one kid. And they said, one of my kids I'd trust to vote. Uh, you know, but they didn't say, yeah, I think the kids should be able to vote. That was, it was what they said. And so I'm basing it on that. I'm also basing it on the fact that, well, if you want to drink, you can't do it. If you want to uh, drive at 16.0, you can't do it. If you want to join the military, buy cigarettes, why can't you? I think there's a reason, and I think that the argument for it is legitimate, but you know, it's kind of like when somebody shouldn't really be voting in Senate, because they really shouldn't then you know, there's no way to balance it. So you're gonna have some people that aren't. The final point is um, I did some research, scientist, and so I looked at all the publications. Uh, so if you're looking at you know, what's on the internet, you gotta see if it's peer reviewed, right? If it's not peer reviewed, I can make it up too. <laughs> peer reviewed, there was two articles that I found, there were two. Austria was included and there was a second one. But there was one that really hit. And that one was, if you're 16, and then two months later, there's a, a federal election and you can't vote. You're like, well, what the hell? You know, you're, you're saying I can vote, but I can't. <clears throat> I don't think that's, that's gonna make anybody feel better. So I think it should be at a larger scale if that's really what people should be able to do. And um, that's my point. I'm going to, I, I can't vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wagner and then Pi Fisher. Pi Fisher? Pi Fisher, Precinct 6, motion to terminate debate. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate. Do we have a second? Second. second. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 22, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. It is terminated. Two, three. Okay, we have five. So uh, let's take a, an electronic vote on termination of debate. And if that fails, we'll take Mr. Gersh and Miss uh, and Dr. Henkin. 
Okay, we have a vote now on, uh, voting is open on termination of debate. If you want to terminate debate, press one for yes. If you want to continue debate, press two for no, or three to abstain. You have 10 seconds. Okay, let's close voting. And debate is terminated, 174 in the affirmative and a loud 35 in the negative <laughs> and three abstentions. So you're now gonna vote on the main motion of Article 22. And while we bring that up, I'll just summarize. Uh, it's a majority vote to authorize the select board to file home rule legislation to allow Arlington to lower the voting age from 18 to 16 for town elections. This is home rule legislation. It has to go uh, to the state level to be approved. Okay. Voting is now open on the main motion of Article 22. So if you're in favor of authorizing, authorizing the select board to file that home rule legislation, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no or three to abstain. Okay, voting is closed. And the motion passes, 161 in the affirmative 49 in negative and four abstentions. Okay. Okay. One second. We have a motion to adjourn and we have a second. Um, yeah. Do we have any notices of reconsideration before we adjourn? Seeing none. All those in favor of adjourning say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. We are adjourned until Monday. Uh, May 13th at 8 p.m. See you then, everybody. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.